very well. We'll be starting a conversation with General Don Oscar Naranjo Trujillo. I'd like to start off by commenting the following. When you hear that Oscar Naranjo has worked for practically two decades on police issues and security issues, for example, you in intelligence in Colombia, you were chief of police, and that uh, would almost want to mean that you see a war against uh, drug traffickers. You believe that will be a confrontation with organized crime. But in general, however, you greatly emphasize the need to humanize the security policy. Why is it necessary to think of the security of families and see the citizen security and public security, not necessarily in terms of the uh, gangsters that fall into jails? To put this statement in context, I'd like to tell you that it's tremendously negative to call a public security policy a war. If today Latin America includes violence and we've said what it reflects is a true humanitarian tragedy, uh, an emergency because of the number of violent deaths that take place in Latin America, studies uh, indicate that Latin America represents f uh, around 46 percent of violent deaths in the world, so the rate is inadmissible. We are 10 percent, 9 percent of the world population. And when we look into why that happens, we have different approaches that I only mentioned to generate debate. One is that security policies entered into a crisis in Latin America, and that crisis is associated, in our opinion, to an authoritarian view of security policy. We must recall that the continent, marked by dictatorial regimes, took the citizenry to think that security was an authoritarian issue. And so the society did not see security as a democratic value. Secondly, different concepts of public security gave privilege to national security, state security, but not public security or citizen security, which actually represent the rationale for, for its existence, because it's the life and values and security of the citizen. Security policy was understood only as a way of combating organized crime and, in particular, drug trafficking. It meant that in recent year times, there was even discussion of having a hard stance in security. When you speak of hard stances in security, you forget whoever makes that statement, that the hardest thing a policeman has in his hand is a weapon. And what he's being told is, use your weapon when they say that. Don't enforce the law. Use your weapon. So, and so when we get to this issue of drugs, with a lot of contagion from the U.S. statement by President Nixon that decreed the war on drugs, this became a formula to combat that phenomenon. What's been made evident is that a view of an integrated view of the policy and in general not involving society to make security its own in terms of its being a democratic value. What's happening, General? Well, Latin Americans have lived the past 10 or to 12 years with very good tailwind economically and unparalleled economic growth. And countries of Brazil have seen a reduction of poverty. However, their uh, violence has greatly heightened. We are the most violent region of the world. We have more than 40 percent of the violent deaths in the world. The spiral of violence in Central America, Mexico, Venezuela, 
Colombia, Brazil, and very complicated issues also arise in Chile, Uruguay. The common types of crime increase greatly as well. How can we explain this growth of violence and being the only region where uh, homicide, violent homicides continue to grow? I think we're paying the cost of having believed arbitrarily that poverty equaled crime. In Latin America, there was a sociological and political thesis that tried to explain violence and crime from the standpoint of poverty. Two very big mistakes were made. The poor were equaled with crime criminals. And secondly, we didn't look at reality. And the reality is that violence in Latin America is associated to criminal economies that mark established marked differences in processes of social inclusion. We're paying the cost of having had public policy and not really having realized that public policy should achieve social inclusion because poverty does not create violence, but social exclusion does. On the other hand, we're paying the cost of for not protecting formal economies. And at this World Economic Forum, I'd like to repeat this with great emphasis. In Latin America, when we give ourselves license to admit an informal economy and informal employment, what we're doing is we're not protecting the formal economy that should be the one to be strengthened to uh, leave those criminal economies and delinquency out of the field. When we in Latin America and countries, let us say, of levels such as the DF in Mexico, competitive on a world level with a very important uh, offer and supply it in many spheres, but you transfer it to other Latin American cities a little less splendorous, you find a common denominator, and that's called public informality. There is nothing more democratic than a public space. And when a society, a country, allow the public space to be appropriated by informal activities, you start up criminality. It's very hard to say this, but I have not been an entrepreneur. I don't come from the economic sphere. I'm just a public official, and I'm terrified to see how some governments have, some states have incorporated the statistics into their statistics, informal employment. And what we're saying is that someone in, on the street invading public space who pays no taxes, who competes with a formally organized cor companies, we actually record their existence and include it in the statistics instead of making an effort to incorporate them to the formal economy. And they appropriate the public space. In fact, it would seem minimal, but public space in Latin America has been taken over by that informality. And on that basis, on that ground, uh, crime grows. There's been a lot of growth in Latin America, but let us think about the quality of growth. For example, we see what happens in Northeast Brazil, where there are urban eruptions that are very disorderly, and we see there that crime, criminality, and murders, homicides, uh, generate great impunity. There is a lack of institutional capacity, in my view. It seems to me that here we have an issue of policemen, judges, jails, and prevention. Are the Latin American states at the level to grapple with all this? What's happened in Latin America? Well, this asymmetry, Rafael, of an economic entrepreneurial world that grows in Latin America versus such an incapacity on the part of the institutions makes evident the following. For as long as entrepreneurial leadership 
took over its formation, its global development involving values and principles and concepts of social responsibility, the states decreased and abandoned the need to grow professionally. A common denominator in Latin America is we do not have a professional bureaucracy. It's a tremendously mobile bureaucracy that goes from government to government because there's no state policy. There are institutions like the police forces, which are true enterprises. When we see a police force of the size of the Colombian force, 170,000 individuals with 150 helicopters administering 45,000 vehicles, 70,000 radios, 60,000 computers, what you have before you is an entrepreneurial challenge in terms of managing it because the Colombian police is above the average of Latin American uh, police forces because it learned to manage itself. And it did it together with entrepreneurs. If we have a message for this forum, it's that entrepreneurs have a lot to transfer in knowledge and good administration practices to the state institutions. And there, an opening stance and a stance of commitment on the part of entrepreneurs could make the difference. Thank you for your reply, General. You know, we've discussed this with Marisol. There is a possibility for us to set up a council or a task force for Latin Americans, not, and not only Latin Americans, but with other parts of the world, that it, the WEF could perhaps think with us, what can we do in this field in Latin America? Because the topic of entrepreneurs, it seems to me in Latin America, they've done three things. One is hide from insecurity when they put up all these uh, bars around their houses. Uh, secondly, they left the business and st stopped investing. Or thirdly, they would say, let us create a voice for entrepreneurs, take a know-how, an entrepreneurial quality to the government sector. So let us to talk about this because we must do things here at the World Economic Forum. It's a very urgent problem for Latin America. I would say that the entrepreneurs in Latin America are a victim of a kind of logical trap. It's led to what you just said, the logic of investing enormous budgets in private security. And actually, when you see what the entrepreneurs in Latin America invest in security, the figures are above the institutional and state budgets. There is a, an imbalance where I would say entrepreneurs are victims of the inability and lack of attention on the part of the state. A functional straightening out of things would have to do with money transferred from private security or better invested directly to uh, finance public security. I bring to this forum the Colombian experience with the uh, net worth tax on large taxpayers. They pay an additional security tax. They've been paying it for about two years. And when we resorted to that, it was supposed to be for only once, for a single time they would pay that tax. But the entrepreneurs discovered that their taxes invested in security started to transform institutions. And now we pay taxes naturally and practically, and it involves an additional element. It provides entrepreneurs a real possibilities to ask for accountability, that institutions be accountable about the transparent implementation of their budgets. You're no longer a Colombian. You're a Latin American. You're Mexican. You're Salvadoran. I know the f that it's a fact. You're traveling all over La around Latin America. And as chief of intelligence, you've been on tours. 
and you've told Mexico, you told El Salvador about 10, 15 years ago, be careful because we're suffering a lot in Colombia, the strengthening of criminality at an international level. How do you see international cooperation in Latin America? Organized crime is transnational, it's evident. Isn't there a cockroach effect now where we uh, press here and the cockroach springs into the house next door? It's happened a lot in uh, Latin America. We had the problem in Mexico. And then we saw the uh, appearance of CETAS, the terrible Central American organization. So how can we cooperate on this urgent topic? Here I have another entrepreneurial example for you. They, they, this man is probably up in the moon, you'll say, and he wants to be, continue to be invited to the forum. But I would say that for as long as entrepreneurs concern themselves with identifying the nature of a globalized world and make it practical, make its ex their entrepreneurial exercises practically in a world with uh, free trade treaties flow, treaties, flow of capital, etc., transboundary flows in the st at the state level, we're still defending the old concepts of sovereignty. And it's incredible that in Europe, with all the different cultures and languages, they have a view, a practical and view of what sovereignty means in a globalized world. Today in Latin America, if you catch a criminal who is a transnational criminal, if you catch him outside his own territory to request the action of the of justice, you must get very complex extradition processes underway. And extraditing a national in Latin America bears a very high political burden. Why should we send him to be judged by another country? This is my competence in my country. That mentality of old-fashioned sovereignty, which understood that each national government was a kind of self-sufficient island, is what is, prevails in the concepts of security in Latin America. We'd have to rethink the sovereignty statutes and at least realize that we have a mobile transnational criminality before us. That means simultaneous and joint action. In Latin America, I would say the topic of depenalizing drugs has become fashionable. First, ex-president Cardoso Gaviria Sevilla talked about it. Now, presidents in office, President Santos Perez Molina, are talking about this. The OES is about to entrust a group with a study, and we see a Latin America that's talking of decriminalizing drugs to find other market solutions. We see many legislators in our countries at all levels, local and national, uh, passing legislation on uh, hard action in Brazil. Now they are lowering the age at which people can be processed as criminals. Is there a way of combating effectively uh, this organized crime aspect in the situation in Latin America, or rather the ones faced by humanity in regard to drug use, Gener generates the need for a debate to have a more integrated overview and to overcome the efficiency status of policies that developed in the past 10, 70 years. But just as I say debate is necessary and dialogue is necessary, it shouldn't just be dialogue concerning decriminalizing or legalizing drugs. Actually, these should be the final issues in that debate, but not the entry point for the debate. 
On the other hand, I think there are many types of confusion, many myths to want to deal with a drug problem as if it were a single drug when the observatory in Europe speaks of more than 400 substances consumed in only in Europe uh, in the past few years. So we would have to have a serious debate. We'd have to look at things drug by drug. And I think we also have some populism at the two ends of those who speak of decriminalizing or and that is that we're not being aware of the reality. The e criminal economy will always be there if the states are not more capable in these terms. And then we have a very a great complication when you see problems of, so, of public security in Latin America. One of the sectors of policies promoting perpetual imprisonment or death penalty and uh, the question is if the average of impunity in Latin America is 82 percent, who are you going to apply this to the eight, to the 18 percent that's truly processed and uh, judge to have judicial, judicial populism by increasing? Uh, penalties by decreasing the age at which people can be accused, giving a 14-year-old the same treatment as you give a 25-year-old uh, criminal. This is giving up the ethical stance of a state that cannot criminalize a child. But we are going along that avenue from the other standpoint. So I think this discussion requires a great dose of humility, because normally discussions are among experts, political or academic leaders, and scientists. And actually, the voice of communities, at least I don't hear it as part of the dialogue. If you go to communities, you see the anguish of a mother who has an addict for a son. And also, the examples that we see in the life of youth with the epidemic and endemic propagation of drugs. I think the a debate coming up from the grassroots of society, of, from citizens, would provide the avenues for solution of this. President Obama will be in Mexico and Costa Rica next week. If Obama were Santa Claus, let's say, and we could ask him for one thing to solve the insecurity problems of Latin America, what would you ask for? Frankly, that's something that can be debated for a long time. I know there, it creates polarities of stances, but I will mention my position, however. I think that arming citizens is actually creating conditions for violence to increase. When you s see the arms industry selling weapons uncontrollably to citizens, you are creating an opportunity for chaos. What's been proven is that states having the monopoly of force and guaranteeing the legitimate use of weapons are societies that have been able to decrease the rates of violent death to one digit, case of Europe, when there are societies that under the other doctrine believe that state and society are defended when each citizen is armed, the indicators of violence grow. So I would ask President Obama You've made a public announcement on the basis of a tragedy, the Sandy Hook tragedy, that shook the whole nation. And that massacre, every three or four weeks, there are collective murders in, in societies. There is a society that is permissive towards having weapons. Let us give that arms industry not deliver weapons to citizens, to private citizens, and in Latin America that we have a commitment, a structural commitment on the part of 
U.S. agencies to combat the arms traffickers. Just to mention the Andean region, the Andean region in the past two years, more than 10,000 assault rifles have been captured. And when you ask who is responsible on the other side that's been judged or processed by legislation, there is no name, there is no mention, the bans of arms traffickers are intact and those would have to be neutralized. President Obama, please take away weapons, at least from the Latin American market. I don't see this problem as being so serious in our uh, region. In Uruguay, not to mention Mexico, in your country, we are truly seeing in unsafe and insecure Latin America, and I'm the idea that the decade of the 70s, the 80s, when we had the problem of the foreign debt, Latin America did not have this common challenge. It's, it's a Latin American challenge, not Mexican, Colombian, Salvadoran, and that's why we think that, as in the 70s, we created great schools of of economics and educated great economists in Latin America. Now we would have to educate and create Oscars Naranjos for Mexico, for Central America. And the fact of the matter is that officials, those that are in charge of security, do not have that preparation. So what can you say? How can we create these Oscar Naranjos police officials, officers with good criteria and that can understand that this is a matter, a humanitarian matter, and that in the end, the individual, the human being, is what we're inhibiting in Latin America with this wave of insecurity is a human being. What would be your answer? Well, I think that the uh, policy politics in the past have been framed by an artificial type of image. We're not, we were not concerned with safety, with security, because the dilemma that we face as politicians is that either you invest in social matters or in political matters. And investing in social without safety means what it has meant, that there's been a lack of growth and values in, in, in living together unity and in safety. And this dichotomy starts to disappear today. But it's disappeared and it is put in evidence. Since we're not concerned in that matter through politics, when we re rebuild this map of the politically responsible for this reality, we can have great surprises. You can find secretaries of public safety of a government or of a state or a person that comes from, you find there a person that comes from the field of, of veterinary or that is a member, an academic that simply performed studies on violence. Why do I bring this up? Because deficit, as you have just said, what it says is that it is necessary from the academia, from politics to have a combination of efforts so that we can prepare a policy that can understand public safety and and collective living. And if we transform police, the police entity, but it doesn't land on positive, on productive results, then we will have no, no results. And we have to include these matters of safety, and we have to do this under the expertise offered by science, experience, and community participation, which is what truly teaches us how to address these problems. And in general, well, I'm, I'm being told that we are, we've run out of time. Time flies here. But I wanted to comment on, on this. Father Solalinde is here. You're an expert in security, and in Mexico, evidently, we have not been able to protect migrants in transit, so to speak. What would you say? What can we do there? Because there's an enormous flow. We're talking about, uh, well, approximately last year we calculated between 70, 80,000 uh, migrants in transit, Central Americans that tried to use Mexico to reach the U.S. So what do you say about that? Well, I think that the world is in deficit with a conceptualization 
regarding global citizenship. That is, today, in the statute of citizenship, we understand ourselves as citizens and we're part of a national state. But when I transit, when I move, when I displace myself towards another national state, I'm not a, a global citizen with full rights. The world should refresh that idea of a global citizen in a globalized world and provide him or her with full rights regardless of the state in which he or she is in. Now, in the Mexican state, I would say that there's going to be a very strong uh, trial and judgment by society against all of us. And, for example, every day, being here, we are aware and we know that a train is moving from south to north, a train that is called the Beast, and it's the convergence point of a human tragedy that result in, viol in rapes, death, violations, kidnappings, tra trafficking of any type, and we don't do anything. I would say that history is going to be very hard on us. And therefore, to put uh, a police, well, a n not a police movement in, in, in place, which is what comes to mind, to contain that strategy is to see how we can have that universe, that human capital, that does not find a sense of the life project for existence. It doesn't really matter if they settle in Guatemala, Belize, Mexico, United States, Canada. In the end, he starts being an individual that is included in a political and social project. And finally, migration is an extreme result of, of social exclusion. When I migrate and I do it under those conditions, it's because I see that I've been socially excluded. I think this is not a police matter. It's not a matter that has, this is fundamentally a matter of social inclusion. Well, the term humility, Apparently, Latin Americans have to be more humble and realize and understand that we have a problem that is multidimensional and that we truly have to do teamwork. We have to work as a team. And finally, entrepreneurs, social leaders have a lot to contribute to the state that, by the way, should be the main stakeholder in this struggle to achieve a safer Latin America. So thank you very much, General.